Thank you. Thank you, Jenya, for the nice introduction. Um, so my plan is to, to switch gears a bit, um, to put more uh, focus on, on, on the material side. So in the, after, in the, in the morning sessions, we've seen a lot um, on, on, on the model side and the solver side, and I would like to focus now a little bit more on the material side. However, keeping the um, a close eye on, on the link to the models we have seen before. So as we just heard, I will talk about many body excitations in the class of layered materials in um, and partially out of equilibrium. Um, so this is work um, which, I, which I've started at the University of Bremen and there um, was Matthias Florian and most importantly Alexander Steinhoff um, who um, participated a lot in, in this project and pushed some of these projects quite heavily and of course uh, Tim Wheeling as well. And um, toward the end of the talk, I will also show some recent results we got together with David Soriano and Alexander Rodenko and of course with Misha Katzelson um, on novel 2D, 2D magnetic systems. Um, so for the outline, my plan is um, to, to convince you that uh, layered materials are extremely interesting in the context of strong correlations. Um, and then that there is um, a very nice way um, how we can model them nowadays with the help of onion functions and, and together with, with the so-called constraint random phase approximation to bring these models on a, um, on a material realistic level. And then I will show you how we did this um, and what kind of results we got in the, in the context of many body excitations uh, for excitons and plasmons in and out of equilibrium for layered semiconductors and layered metals. Um, so, regarding layered metals or layered materials, so when I when I use the term layered materials, what I have in mind are structures like these. So these are 2D and finally extended materials in the x and y direction and somewhat confined in the z direction. Um, but this confinement is, is meant in, the, in a hopping sense, meaning there's no strong hopping between these layers um, of, of these layered materials um, and yeah, they, they are just stuck or hold together by thunderbolts forces. And of course, there, as you know, there's nowadays not just graphene or stacks of graphene, which is called graphite, um, available, but a whole zoo of 2D materials. And with this whole zoo of 2D materials, also a whole zoo of, um, of correlation effects enters the, well, the, the stage um, in this respect. So on the in many body instability sites, we, for example, find superconductivity in electron doped molybdenum disulfide. So molybdenum disulfide is one of the, one of the uh, uh, material from the so-called transition metal dichicogonite classes. And molybdenum disulfide on its own is a, is a semiconductor, but when we slightly electron dope it, um, we find, or Stephen Ye in, um, found nicely, this superconducting dome with increasing uh, uh, TC, so transition temperatures. And here, already one interesting point pops up, which is um, the dependence of this TC of the transition temperature as a function of the involved layer. So you see for, for just a monolayer, TC is rather low, and then increasing the number of layers, TC um, changes, meaning the, the exact geometry and the surrounding affects these many body instabilities. Um, this is also true, for example, for charge density waves, which can be found um, in metallic and transition metal like trichogonite, so here in the case of silenite, um, where the uh, superconducting, uh, where the transition temperature to the to the charge density wave regime um, changes as the number of, of layers again yeah, red dots. Um, and finally, so this is this is somewhat new to the community, at least uh, since 2017. Um, also, magnetism was found finally in these 2D materials in the class of chromium trihalide. So here in the case of chromium uh, chromium iodide, um, where we nicely see the hysteresis effect in terms of the magnetization as a function of an outer magnetic field, which again is a function of the involved uh, number of layers. Um, so this is the instability sites, and then there are also um, strong and pronounced many body excitations found in these materials. And here I need to start just by definition more or less with excitons. So um, in, again, in semiconducting molybdenum disulfide, uh, the absorption spectra shows here, for example, these two pronounced peaks, um, which can be uh, defined or which 
which we nowadays know are coming from excitons or electron strong electron hole bound states um, within the material and they are so pronounced here in the sense that the binding energy is on the order of several hundred milli electron volts which is one or two orders of magnitude larger than um, in, in standard 3d systems and again these excitonic absorptions or these excitonic spectral features are again a function of, um, um, of its surrounding. So here in the case actually it's a more a function of, of an outer probe. So this is an outer equilibrium state which we'll discuss in more detail later on. Manuel, Manuel, I think your, your microphone is on. So if you could switch it off it would be great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so then next to excitons, we also have plasmons um, in, in these uh, in metallic layered materials, which again behave a bit differently than in 3D, meaning instead of having um, a constant plasmon dispersion, we have the square like plasmon dispersion for small momenta, which then flattens for, for larger momenta. And again, as a function of the environment, this changes, uh, this can, these excitations can strongly change. We will also talk about this in a second. Um, and lastly, since we also now have these, these magnetic materials, you also find um, uh, magnons in these, uh, in these material class. Um, and again, these magnons are also controlled or at least affected by the number of involved layers. And then we can also think about um, both of these sides at the same time, meaning actually, um, many body instabilities and many body excitations. For example, in the case of tantalum nickel selenide, TNSE, um, which is uh, an excitonic um, insulating candidate material. So as you know, there was the prediction um, a few, from decades ago that um, excitons might condensate as well. And TNSE was one of the um, most important candidates in this material. And indeed, um, Ours, we, are we together with um, Giacomo Mazza um, and many others um, investigate this material in, in, in detail and what we found is um, that some sort of an excitonic transition is there in the sense that a nearest neighbor Coulomb interaction within this layered material between the tantalum and the nickel sites um, can cha drastically change the, the band structure from, um, from a, a strongly overlapping band um, metal to a nicely get um, semiconductor with an intermediate regime where we have this uh, these overlap or where we have these hybridized bands which is coming from this excitonic like transition in this material class and also there are there are already from 40 years ago um, um, ideas and calculations from Takada showing for example that plasmons in 2D systems can indeed uh, already mediate on their own just on their own without phonons uh, superconductivity so this means um, that there are a variety of pronouns many body excitations in these uh, layered materials uh, to be found and, and are already found um, we have a lot of fascinating many body instabilities and most likely also quite uh, quite some very uh, quite some quite a few interesting novel correlated phases available which are all sensitive to external um, stimuli in terms of excitations or modifications to the uh, let's say the dielectric environment and in fact this is something we can at least hand wavingly easily understand by just remembering that a 2d material is in the end nothing else than two surfaces but this has two effects since now the surface can be treated extremely efficiently from the outside so any change to the surface will change most likely the material properties and at the same time this is the property i will concentrate on the most in the following um, if we think about the electric field lines connecting different um, charges in this in, in, a, in a 2d material we immediately see that most of these field lines lie on the outside and if they lie on the outside let's say here in the in, in vacuum they cannot polarize the environment and therefore they cannot uh, and put, you know, there's no external screening, which means that the Coulomb interaction in, in layered materials is in, generally, is in general increased due to the lack of environmental screening. And this is the important point, another very important point, it's in general long ranged. And this is the reason why we, for example, found enhanced um, electron lattice couplings, which is something Eric van Loon will talk about in more detail on Friday. Um, but this is also the reason why we find these strongly enhanced excitonic binding energies, um, or why we find these, these um, let's say, sensitive plasmons, or hopefully also magnons, as we need to see in the future, hopefully. Um, 
in the sense that they are sensitive to the environment, since if we change uh, the, the screening of the environment, we change the couple, the Coulomb interaction, thereby we change these excitations. Um, so why do I believe that um, many body excitations play a special role? Um, the answer is, is rather, rather simple, which is um, that many body excitations are, of course, an intrinsic fundamental property of uh, correlated materials. Meaning if we understand them, if we can predict them, if we can compare them theoretically to experimental results, um, I would say we understand a lot about um, um, the specific material um, at hand. Um, at the same time, uh, they can um, often be seen as precursors towards instabilities. So, for example, softening of a phonon um, indicates um, the tendency to form a charge density wave formation or softening of, of a plasmon mode uh, was interpreted, for example, by Peter Abermonti to, to be uh, the precursor of the excitonic instability in, in another um, class of material. Um, and these many body excitation render a lot of uh, details of the fundamental interactions, which means the Coulomb interaction, for example, here, meaning the, these, the, the, disp the energies of our excitations, many body excitation, and their other dispersions are decisively defined by the Coulomb interaction. Meaning, again, if we understand them, we understand uh, these intrinsic Coulomb interaction properties, um, which is why uh, we study them um, in that detail. Um, and in order to study them, um, what we need is, in the end, um, some sort of a lightweight uh, or lightweighted models um, which are capable of describing the influence of the different environments as well as um, the, the external stimuli, let them be electronic doping or um, excitations by well, some, some um, light field. And we need to apply them uh, to different levels of theory. Um, and in order to do so, to set up these lightweighted models, um, um, it turns out that, that the Vanier basis seems to be a very, uh, very straightforward and, and good way to go, um, which then links um, these low energy space uh, models um, to, to the yeah, material realism side, since we can derive these Vanier functions and all what follows from first principles. Meaning we can nowadays set up um, these um, generalized Harvard models, including hopping and Coulomb matrix elements, and maybe also electron phonon couplings um, within this bunny basis um, from first principles, and then solve them uh, with the techniques, uh, with a few of these techniques which we heard uh, in the morning session. So, how do we do that? Um, so what we normally do is we start with a, um, with, an, with a DFT calculation or some other ab initio calculation, which gives us a band structure like this. So this is the case of molybdenum disulfide, which is a semiconductor. So we have a valence band and a conduction band. And then uh, we define our subspace, our low energy space. So here are these red bands. Um, shall now uh, form our subspace, which are formed here in the case, uh, in this case of molybdenum disulfide by, by three different d orbitals. And then we ac actually kick out all of these other black bands um, of the rest space. Um, this is in principle fine, but we need to remember that the Coulomb interaction is actually screened by all of these um, 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 grayish rest bands which I kicked out, meaning there are polarizations like this or like that or like that, uh, which will effectively screen the Coulomb interaction within our red uh, band structure with our minimum model. And therefore, we, will, we would neglect a lot of screening if we just would use these red bands and, and therefore what we do is we use this constraint random phase approximation to calculate the screening of the rest uh, band structure which is not part of our minimum model anymore um, to which are then included here in this Coulomb matrix element u. Um, right. And furthermore, we also need to think about what happens now if, if we introduce a, a substrate or some other uh, changes to the, to the environment. And in, 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 in this band structure picture, it's, it's rather easy since this additional um, material, environmental material, we create additional bands, which can then create additional polarizations, which means that there will be additional part in our polarization as defined in our dielectric function. Um, which we might write as a total dielectric function de defining the screening coming from the rest band, rest band, background bands, and these substrate bands, for example. And the interesting or the nice 
part is now that this dielectric function defining or describing um, the screening from the rest bands as well as from the substrate is something we can calculate from, uh, from electrostatics. So this is something we can borrow from, from uh, a non-quantum mechanics um, in theory. Meaning, if we just generalize this, this setup in, in the sense that we have a blue 2D material which has some dielectric uh, screening property epsilon background, and then there is some dielectric screening below and above, um, this is a well defined um, dielectric problem with dielectric interfaces which we can solve, uh, as I said, using electrostatics. And if we do so, we get this rather ugly dielectric function, epsilon background and substrate here, shown on the right side, um, which we can, however, understand easily if we just let's forget about this environment, environmental screening for a second and say this is a vacuum, so freestanding layer, um, then this dielectric function looks like this. So for uh, the momentum going to zero, uh, this dielectric function goes to one, and for larger momenta, uh, this dielectric function um, saturates. Meaning, this is something most important, uh, extremely important message here. This is non-local screening coming intrinsically from the two-dimensionality of the material. Um, and we also can understand nicely this dielectric function um, if we think about, let's say, two uh, charge carriers which are close together, meaning momentum space. This would be then for the situation of large momenta. And here you see in the sketch that uh, these carriers will most, most of it all feel just the blue dielectric environment and there's, n there's somewhat of a local screening over there. But if these charge carriers are far away from each other, most again, most of the field lines will lie on the outside and there's no um, internal screening anymore so that this dielectric function goes to one. Um, and if we now introduce this substrate again, we can also now nicely understand what's happening. And what's happening is that just the small momenta uh, uh, in this dielectric function will change. Right, so this means uh, we have a macroscopic understanding of the dielectric uh, screening properties of 2D layered materials. And together with this definition of the Coulomb interaction in, in the Vanier basis, uh, we can, yeah, which is something we can merge, we have nowadays very precise and, and, and well-defined models at hand to study the, the physics of these materials. And now we actually use exactly these material, these models to study plasmons and excitons and also magnons in, in, in layered materials. So in the first uh, part here, I would like to quickly give you an idea how plasmons um, look like in 2D and, and doped molybdenum disulfide, where we wanted to understand how plasmonic excitations are influenced by these internal screening channels as well as by these external screening channels and what the influence of um, doping or external excitation can be. And to this end, um, I start here with just the Fermi surface, let's say, of the whole doped molybdenum disulfide, which has pockets around just this, uh, these corners. And for this band structure, uh, we can then calculate this electron energy uh, and the electron energy loss spectrum, the yields, which is proportional to the imaginary part of the inverse of the dielectric function, which in turn we can calculate from RPA by using our Coulomb interaction, so this model Coulomb interaction, as I just showed you, together with the polarization, which we can calculate from the band structure, from the, from the minimal band structure. And if we do so, we get an yields like this, which shows you um, the, the, the yields from in Q space uh, connecting, let's say, uh, two different uh, pockets uh, here at K or having intra pocket uh, plasmons around gamma. What you immediately see is that there is a nice defined branch, which is a nice defined plasmon branch, which behaves for very, very small momenta like we would expect for 2D materials, for 2D, for 2D electron gas, meaning it behaves, uh, it disperses like a square root of Q. However, for slightly enhanced momenta, um, this already changes drastically. And this changes in, the, in, in this square root-like dispersion is something coming from this background, intrinsic background screen. Um, so we can derive formulas for the plasma dispersion in, 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 the, in the presence of, um, of slightly modified um, Coulomb interaction use of Q's, use of Q, um, which 
uh, if you remember, uh, not suffer, but are affected by the substrate or and, 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 environment and rest screening from the rest band structure, creating this kind of shape, meaning U of Q is the bare Coulomb interaction divided by this epsilon of Q. And thereby you see for small um, Qs, um, we do not change the bare Coulomb interaction like in 2D um, at all, meaning there we are still in the square root like behavior. But as soon as we go to slightly larger momenta, we increase the screening, we decrease the Coulomb interaction, and thereby we flatten our dispersion until it merges with the continuum. Right, and then we can also, with these models, we can then understand and, and, and study in detail how, for example, um, spin-orbit coupling changes the situation, but let me skip this and go directly here, where I would like to show you how plasmons can indeed be tuned by uh, the substrate. So as I said, so when, when we change the environment, this, the, this environment, we change the screening, which means we change this epsilon function and push thereby, here the, the, the plasma dispersion is this, this, um, this black uh, line over here. And you see if we increase the environment to screening, meaning if we put our layer 2D metal on the substrate, um, we push down the plasma dispersion for small momentum. And at the same time, by increasing the doping, we increase the, the dispersion everywhere, more or less, um, and get, therefore, quite, quite some control, um, gains quite some control on the plasma dispersion, depending on the screening and the doping, which is something we are investigating right now and in, in detail it might be extremely important for the electron plasma coupling uh, in the case of plasmonic superconductivity. Right, so this was equilibrium physics. So now let's switch gears a bit and, and talk about um, photodope systems. So this is now, um, how, yeah, I would call it out of equilibrium physics, um, where we wanted to understand how the excitonic um, properties or optical absorption properties of our uh, MOS2 monolayer, semiconducting monolayer, changes under the optical pump in external excitation, bringing um, electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. And what we wanted to understand here is how these free electrons uh, and free, free holes interplay uh, with the resulting um, excitons, so these bound electron hole pairs. And therefore, we used, uh, or this is, this is what we did in, in detail with Alexander Steinhoff and Matthias Florian from, from Bremen, um, who used this uh, semiconductor Bloch equation. So, this is in order to study uh, in the end the op optical absorption under the influence of. Um, of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the external excitation. So this is some sort of an of a, um, of a equation of motion technique, but um, sophisticated derived from, from, from Keldish techniques, uh, meaning allowing us to do this in this um, out of equilibrium state where we have uh, electron and hole um, um, densities on their own. And what is nice is about the theory is that we can uh, that the input parameters or the input quantities are all defined by these models um, as we derived them before. Meaning there's the dispersion, there's Coulomb interaction matrix elements, and all that is accessible now with these highly precise models. Meaning we can now calculate the, the optical absorption spectra, including uh, excitons, for molybdenum disulfide, for example. And this is exactly what we did here. So let's start here in the lower in the lower um, um, corner, um, where I show you the absorption spectra uh, without an, um, an, an optical pump, uh, where you see these A and B peaks, which would vanish as soon as uh, we switch off the Coulomb interaction. Meaning these uh, these peaks are clearly coming from um, yeah, electron hole bindings, excitonic um, um, absorptions. And you see they are splitting. The splitting is something which relates to the, or which comes from the splitting, spin-orbit splitting in, the, in this K-valley here on the, our, our, our band structure. Um, right. And in order to understand what happens now when we increase the optical pump, we need to define a few quantities. So there is the band gap, which is in the, in the ground state, something on the order of 2.6 something electron volts, so meaning it's here at the edge. Mm. Here in this panel, I will show you how the band gap changes up on the, um, the pump. Um, and then um, we define the, the, the you know, energetic distance between our optical excitation and the band gap as the excitonic binding energy, which is in this case here on the order of, of 400, 500 milli electron volts, which is this high order, large order, which I was referring to before. 
um, and this excitonic binding energy is shown here in this in this lower panel. So now if you bring by this optical doping, photon doping electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, um, we will create free uh, electrons in the in the conduction band and, and free holes in the in the in the valence band, which then screen um, additionally. And this additional screening will then reduce our Coulomb interaction in the material. And reducing the Coulomb interaction, this material has uh, one important um, yeah, property, which means it strongly decreases the band gap. So the, by by increasing uh, this this photo doping um, and this switching on this pump, we increase the free the number of free electrons and free carriers, which increases the screening and thereby decreases the Coulomb interaction and thereby decreases the band gap. At the same time, you see the the excitonic peak didn't change too drastically, which means that the excitonic binding energy, however did drastically change. So before it was something like 400, 500 milli electron volts binding energy. Now the binding, the exit, the band gap changed drastically to this red um, area here. And therefore the binding energy is reduced to something like 150 milli electron volts. And overall you see there's somewhat of a, of a constant, uh, slight, slight change in the excitonic position. Meaning what happens, as I said before, we change upon photodoping um, uh, the band gap, but we also change the binding energy of the excitons, uh, which then somewhat um, uh, stabilized this, the excitonic position. And this was uh, a prediction we made in 2014 um, without experimental evidence at this point, which was, however, experimentally ver verified just a few months after uh, we came up um, with our or we came out with our results. So, meaning these models are indeed um, uh, at least good enough to describe the most physics and 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 even even on a nearly quantitative level. But we didn't stop here. So the next, uh, the next step, we wanted to understand um, how these free electrons and free holes in the, in the valence and conduction band um, somehow interact with the bound pairs of electrons and holes, meaning with the bound excitons. So in a chemical picture, we might see this as, uh, as, as some sort of, a, of an equilibrium be between free electron and holes, um, so between free, free carriers and these bound carriers, which means that um, the number of electrons is always uh, given by, let's say, the number of free electrons and uh, the number of electrons which are bound in our excitons. To describe this on a, on a, on a theoretical level, um, we need to um, go beyond this standard GW um, cell energies by also including um, the excitonic effects. And this is what we did here. Uh, or most importantly, Alex Steinhoff did this uh, by solving the Peter equation to get the excitonic bound states, which then allowed us um, to define this, this T matrix self energy here, which then renders um, excitonic properties out of equilibrium under this photo excitations in this total self energy. And this, of course, leads to the fact that in our spectral function, we, we do not have now. Um, just the uh, the renormalized um, bands and 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 some some spectral uh, shifts, but also an additional term which is coming from this additional self energy part from the excitons. Now, if we think about um, let's say time uh, uh, time resolved ARPES experiment, so meaning we do a pump and then we measure with an ARPES experiment the the, the band structure afterwards. Um, this additional term will have quite an interesting effect, which means, for example, here in the, in the valence band, we will see these occupied states. So this is now the K value, and this is the, the next value, which we call sigma, um, which is the standard ARPIS measurement you, you would um, expect. But, and this is the important part, this additional part in the self energy, in the electronic self energy, also creates some sort of, of, uh, of additional weight here in the spectral function, in the spectral function, exactly. And this additional weight is actually nothing else than um, additional weight coming from excitonic satellites. Meaning in a, in a pump probe experiment like this, uh, you should really see the effects um, of, of excitons in this uh, band, um, band structure picture. Um, right, and then we analyzed also in, in more detail how these free carriers, so let's say free electrons, uh, behave in, in, in contrast to uh, the bound carriers uh, or the total carrier densities in, in terms of the 
electrons, free electrons and the uh, bound ones. So this ratio alpha uh, gives you a measure of how many free electrons or free carriers we have in contrast to how many bound carriers in this excitons we have. And what you see is here for quite a bunch of different materials is that if we increase the uh, this pump uh, pulse through the external pump pulse, um, we bring more and more carriers uh, into this excitonic um, situation, meaning more and more carriers are bound um, in excitonic states. However, if we pump, if we increase this, this pump pulse more and more and more, we see that suddenly we have a strong change in this alpha ratio um, going to one again, meaning we are left over with just free carriers. This is what the optical quantum optical community also calls a mod transition here. This is something um, we can also see and somewhat understand in the terms of the, of the spectral function, since what's happening under this optical pump is that the free carriers, so this, these, these spectral features are here, uh, uh, spectral features coming from our free carriers, they, they move to, in this case, to, to higher energies due to the reduction of the, of the Coulomb interaction, while our excitonic um, spectral features go to um, smaller and smaller energies, meaning the difference or the binding energy of our excitons um, gets smaller and smaller until they merge and we are back into this uh, single um, feature just uh, defining uh, or coming from the free carriers. And this is, of course, something we also see then in the band gap. So, so again, here we see the band gap in, in, in this material class as a function of the external doping. And around this, this mod transition here, this optical mod transition, we see that we have a strong change in the, in the band gap. And again, this is a function, or this can, can also be strongly affected by the uh, surrounding material. So you see, as soon as we introduce a substrate screening, let's say here from below with epsilon substrate two, epsilon four or 10, um, this strongly decreases the number of excitons we have. And this is um, just due to the fact that we decrease um, our Coulomb interaction um, um, additionally, and thereby we decrease the binding energy, the excitonic binding energy, and therefore, uh, yeah, make free carriers more likely to be free and not to be bound. However, we still see this kind of mod transition, even um, if we are uh, fully sandwiched um, the material. Right, so then let me go to my last topic, which are magnons in these chromium um, trihalides. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you have roughly like less than 10 minutes, including questions. Perfect. This is perfectly fine. So I need five more minutes here for these magnons, and then we have some time for the question. Um, so then, um, this is ongoing study, so meaning here I cannot go into it too much detail. Just to give you an idea, um, so these chromium trihalides are defined by chromium atoms living um, on, a, on a honeycomb lattice surrounded by um, these um, yeah, legions in an octahedral fashion, meaning our chromium d orbitals, of course, um, uh, split into a T2G and an EG manifold. And if we do our electron counting right in, in this material class, we see that we are left over with three electrons in, in the T2G um, 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 channel, meaning this is half filled. We then do LSDA plus U calculations, um, meaning taking the spin degree of freedom into account and the Coulomb repulsion. Um, we see actually this work, these are calculations by Alexander Rudenko uh, with colleagues from, from Ekaterinburg, from um, Vladimir Mazurenko's group. Um, and there they nicely show, see that um, we, we, we split the spin channels and what we are left over with um, is um, our T2G orbitals here, let's say in the spin up channels, um, strongly occupied and overlapping with the legions in blue, uh, and a empty um, EG spin up state, or empty EG spin up states, uh, while on the spin down side, both T2G and EG are overlapping and both are uh, unoccupied. And this actually now creates quite interesting um, interplay between different orbital channels in, uh, in the effective Heisenberg exchange parameters. As you can easily imagine that um, following Kanamori or whoever, um, that the T2G, uh, T2G channel between one chromium and the other chromium um, orbital uh, or site um, um, will create the standard Heisenberg exchange properties which gives you normally antiferromagnetic um, coupling. But the coupling between the T2Gs and the EGs, this is however ferromagnetic. 
meaning there is an intrinsic um, competition between, between these different magnetic channels. And indeed, this is something um, Sascha and, and, and the colleagues from Ekaterinburg already calculated using this lovely magnetic force theorem in an in a orbital resolved way. So what you see now here is in the blue dots are um, the T2G, T2G, Heisenberg, J exchange parameters, um, while in the, in the blue crosses and uh, the blue squares, we see the T2G, EG, um, um, nearest neighbor Heisenberg exchange parameters as a function of this LDA, LSDA plus U, U parameter. What you see is that they, they are both there. They are on somewhat the same order. However, there is asymmetry in there, and this asymmetry between the um, between the sorry the antiferromagnetic um, T to G T to G um, coupling and the ferromagnetic T to G E G coupling. Now this creates in the end uh, uh, yeah, leftover magnet magnetization, so that we are left over with the ferromagnetic insulator in this situation. And now from these J's, um, we can also calculate uh, magnonic properties and get the magnon spectrum as well. And this is more or less already the end of my talk and just more or less already an outlook since what we want to do next year is we want to understand how magnons are affected, of course, by the environment or the external excitations. Um, and whether or not we need vertex corrections. And this is so far absolutely not clear if, if LSDA plus U is doing something good or not. And we did the first step, so we did already some modeling, so we created um, some, some Vani function using Vani 90, we, cal we calculated the CRPA Coulomb matrix elements, and then using um, home, uh, homebrewed Hartree Fock as well as Hugo's lovely Hartree Fock implementation TPRF, um, we are now able to reproduce more or less the LSDA plus U calculation on the model level, so externally from these Abinicio calculations, which now um, serve as a perfect foundation to go on with the uh, many body you know, calculations. So this is already my conclusion. So I hope that I convinced you that these ab initio models based on Vanier function in combination with uh, the CRPA Coulomb matrix elements and uh, this, this effective modeling of the substrate uh, indeed results in rather precise models for layered materials and that in combination with high level many body theory this allows us to calculate materialistic um, correlation phenomena and for the outlook and as a question uh, and ideas for the future and then in the, in the project um, so i would definitely would like to use these de these, these these models in more detail to understand magnetism in these chromium um, trihalides in more detail. So what is the effect of the multilayering structure in, in reality? What, what do heterostructures look like? And also I would like to expand um, my, my you know, calculation for the superconducting area a bit more in, in terms of, let's say, you might know about iron selenide, but it doesn't matter, but superconductivity in, let's say, in optical cavities, so meaning out of equilibrium. Yes, and this is it. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.